Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, Isaiah chapter 45 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you've got a copy of God's Word, why don't you go ahead and fire it open to Isaiah chapter 45. Well, it was just a few months ago that our family moved to this area, and we had a few decisions to make about our family. And one of those decisions that we made, kind of a big decision for us as a family, was that we were going to enroll our girls in public school. This was actually a very big change for me. Because, you see, for two years, our girls had independent study on their computers, so they would do their homeschooling work, and they would fill out their paperwork, get it submitted, and all would be well. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to class, they're having homework, and they're coming to me and saying, hey, Dad, can you help me with my homework? I thought this was going to be a really cool ego boost for me, because I feel like I'm an all-star at seventh grade pre-algebra. However... My seventh grade daughter came to me and said, Dad, can you help me with my pre-algebra? And I said to her, of course I can help you with your pre-algebra. And I began looking at the problem and began jotting down the notes. I'm like, see, you do this, and then you do that, and then you do that. And I said, and here's the answer. And she looked at me, and I'm kind of smiling like I'm the Mozart of math, and I've just kind of gotten this all accomplished. And, And she's like, that's not how we do it, Dad. And I looked at her, and I said, but did I get the right answer? And she said, I don't care. She said, we have to do it this way. Well, you know, that's kind of funny with seventh grade math, but how often do we approach life and do we approach our relationship with God that way? God, it's hard for me to trust you to get the right result if I don't understand the process of how you're doing it. And so we come to God and we say, God, you have to do it this way. It's hard to trust you're headed for the right result when you don't understand the process. God's call to us so often is trust me and our answer can easily be, God, it's hard to trust you when you're headed down this path. It's hard to trust you, God, when it's scary. It's hard to trust you, God, when it doesn't look at all like what I signed up for. And that's the lesson God's people Israel needed to learn in Isaiah chapter 45 this morning. In fact, That sets up our main point for the text this morning. Trusting God for a good result requires trusting God through the process. And God's map might look different than mine, but he's still at work to get me to the right destination. One of my favorite bands when I was in college was Cademan's Call, and they had a lyric that means so much to me. It just says this, you can't plan the ends and not plan the means. If God is going to get us where he wants us, he will plan the way to get us there. So God, through Isaiah, is going to do something pretty spectacular here in this passage. 150 years before the events that are being described in this passage, God is going to preview and prophesy through Isaiah what God's plan is. And then God's going to consider an objection that he anticipates would come from his people. And finally, he'll explain why he chose the specific plan that he chose to achieve the result that his people needed. Now, this is so helpful for us because so often we're asked to trust God and walk by faith. And we have questions when we're walking by faith. We have questions because walking by faith is hard. And the reason walking by faith is hard is because we're in the middle of something and we don't exactly see the end result. We're in the process. God has promised the destination, but we're like, how do you really think I'm going to get from here to there if I have to walk through this? God, it's really hard to trust you when you ask me to go through this. And so we have questions like, God, how can I trust you when I got passed over for that promotion that I thought I was supposed to get? God, God, how can I trust you when my kid went off to college and they got that one professor for philosophy class and now they're coming home and they're questioning everything about my faith? God, how can I trust you when my friend from Ohio just died of COVID at age 55? That's a true story that happened to us this week. And maybe in light of today's focus on the persecuted church, we should be saying, God, how are our brothers and sisters trusting you? When they hear that we're gathered for church in a beautiful building with soft, comfortable chairs, and they're gathered in the basement, hiding out by candlelight, hoping that the authorities won't discover them. Did you know that the Chinese church has a saying? They say in America, you send your pastors to seminary to prepare for ministry in China. We send our pastors to prison to prepare for ministry. How can I trust you, God, when the path leads through this process 
that seems so hard and so difficult to understand. Here's why today's passage is so great. When we don't have answers to our specific questions about why God does what he does in specific situations, our faith can be strengthened by seeing why God did what he did in the specific situations of other people. And so the specific situation that we're going to be diving into here in Isaiah was God's people, his nation, Israel, asking the question, why are you doing what you're doing for us as a people? So God's people, Israel, got booted out of the land that God promised to give them and they were living as prisoners of war or exiles in a different land. The kings of Israel were no more. The people of Israel were being ruled by foreign kings. And so the people were saying, God, how can your promises play out when we're not in our place, when our people don't have prominence, when we don't even have independence to set up our own rulers? And they had a lot of questions But I believe that when we see how God orchestrated the big picture of world history to accomplish his purposes, it'll help us trust the small picture of our lives and what God's doing in our situations to help us see how our lives fit into the big purposes of God. We can lean on the faith that was seen by God's purposes in the past to give us faith for the unseen as we face our situations in the present. So this morning, we're gonna trace this theme of God's faithfulness and God's plan in a three-part outline through Isaiah chapter 45 We're going to first see God's plan, then we're going to see how God's people question God's plan, and finally we're going to see the answer God gave to help them understand God's plan. And I think as you see how God explains to Israel what his plan was for Israel, it'll help you see what God's plan is for you and help you trust God's plan for your life. So let's begin with seeing God's plan. And God's plan can be defined with just two simple words. God's plan was using Cyrus Uh, Cyrus, the king or emperor of Persia, the second empire that conquered the known world, first Babylon, and now Persia's coming along. Here's what it says in Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. Let's pause right there. So chapter 45 opens with God giving a word to Cyrus. That's kind of what it appears like on the surface, but when you dig deeper, you realize that God wasn't actually giving a word to Cyrus because Cyrus and God didn't really have a thing. Um, Cyrus was a polytheistic pagan punk, and so he worshiped a whole bunch of gods, so he and God weren't exactly on super great speaking terms. And so God wasn't talking to Cyrus because they didn't have open lines of communication. So actually what was happening is God was talking like he would talk to Cyrus if in fact he was talking to Cyrus, but he was actually just saying this for his people to eavesdrop on what God would say to Cyrus if he was talking to Cyrus. This is for God's people to check out what the conversation would be like. And in the speech that God would give to Cyrus, that's outlined here in the text. God's like, hey, Cyrus, I'm going to designate your role and then I'm going to give you some promises. So you need to see what your role is going to be and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do for you so you can fulfill that role. The common thing in both designating the role of Cyrus and giving some promises to Cyrus is that everything that's talked about for Cyrus is stuff that should have gone to Israel. So the role that Cyrus is going to fill, you would think would be filled by an Israelite and the promises given to Cyrus, you'd think would be promises given to God's chosen people. So you can imagine that as the God's people are hearing this, as line by line unfolds, they'd be like, hey, hey, stop that. That's my stuff. That's my role. Well, let's unfold what all is happening in those verses we just read. Did you see in verse one, the title given to Cyrus? It says, thus says the Lord to his anointed. An anointed person is someone set apart to fulfill God's special purposes for them. Israel's kings were anointed. Their first king, Saul, was anointed. Their best king, David, was appointed. Aaron, when he was getting ready to be Israel's first high priest, was anointed. So special people serving a special role in Israel get anointed. In fact, interestingly, the word anointed one in this passage is the Hebrew word Mashiach which is often translated Messiah. Now that gets really interesting because God says, hey, the promised one who's going to fulfill the purposes of God is no longer someone from your nation. It's this 
pagan king who doesn't know anything about the God of your nation. The Messiah that they anticipated was one who would fulfill the role of David by doing what David had done in a new and greater and better way. In fact, uh, the other title we got for Cyrus, which actually happened in the last verse of the last chapter, kind of uh, confirms this. It says in verse 28, God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now that's David language getting applied to Cyrus. A shepherd was not just someone who tended sheep, it was someone who tended to people. In fact, that's why David was called the shepherd king because his first job tending lambs was meant to be a preview of his greater job of being a king and tending to people. And so the people, as they were in exile, were looking for a king or a leader or an anointed one or a Messiah to come who would get them out of their predicament and shepherd them by returning them to the places and the promises that God had for them. And so as they're looking around for an anointed one to come and do this for them, God says, hey, I got an anointed one for you. It's Cyrus. Now, now, here's the thing. The Israelites would have been like God You've anointed people for generations, but it's always been the right person from the right people group. It's always been one of our people. It reminds me of American politics, actually. Have you uh, been following the election results this week? So Tuesday night, I decided to follow the results of the governor election that was going on. It was kind of a big deal on the news, and I needed something to watch while I was doing my indoor exercise bike. So I, I thought this would be super fun. This is, this is how I did it. Um, I got on my bike and I started listening to the results and I would watch Fox News for five minutes and I would flip over and watch CNN for five minutes and I kept flipping back and forth. And it, it was really a fun exercise because on one side, it's like, this is the awesomest thing ever. And on the other side, it's like, death, doom, and destruction now. But is, isn't that kind of how we view American politics? Like if my person wins, then everything is roses. And if the other person wins, like build a bomb shelter because it's all gonna blow up. And, 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 and here's the thing, for Israel, it wasn't like even that. It would be like, when they said we're going to use Cyrus, it would be like, imagine in a few years when the 2024 presidential election's going down, imagine if they've got all these, you know, decision 2024, and it comes across, and it's like, breaking news, zero votes for the Democrat and zero votes for the Republican. All the votes went to President Xi Jinping, from China. I hope I said his name right. But imagine if we're like, yo, the next president of the United States is the communist Chinese guy. Would you not be like, um, time out. That's not going to work super well. But that's what it was like for God's people to hear that Cyrus was going to be the next world emperor. See, when empires changed hands in that culture, it didn't typically bode well for the people who were under the rule of the emperor. People were like pawns, and as the dominoes fell, the consequences and the cost of the transitions of power usually fell on the poor and common people. And so as God's people heard that a new king was being raised to power, as they contemplated the history that they knew, they surely were thinking, this won't end well. Not only did God appoint Cyrus to fulfill an Israelite role to be the anointed one or the ruler, he also gave a bunch of Israel's promises to Cyrus. In fact, if you look in the text, really interesting, verse 2, it says, I will go before you. Now, those are the exact same words that God said to his people when they were leaving Egypt and getting ready to go on the exodus. Remember, God led his people across the wilderness and the desert to the promised land. He said, I will go before you. And he did with a column of fire and in a cloud. And the same promise that God made to Israel, he now gives to Cyrus. It's interesting in Exodus 3, verse 22, God promised to Israel that they would plunder the riches of the Egyptians. And then here in the text, God's like, hey, Cyrus, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. Interesting that 150 years before Cyrus ever got any treasure, God said to him that this is the treasure that he would get. 
Cyrus conquered a territory that belonged to a man named King Croesus, and as he was exploring the territory that was left for him, they began wading through some rivers in that territory. And typically, when you're walking in a river, you expect there to be sand or rocks underneath your feet, but they began feeling something a little weird. And so they got down under the water into the darkness or the secret places, and they discovered that running through the rivers in this conquered territory was just an abundance of gold. And so Cyrus was rich, just as God had promised and predicted. Very interesting, in Isaiah chapter 41, God says to his people in verse 13, I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. He promised to his people his promise and his presence and his leadership. But in verse 1 of chapter 45, the Lord says to Cyrus, I'm going to grasp your right hand. God was giving to this pagan king all the promises that his people thought should have gone to them. God's people thought that they should be the conquerors, not the conquered. And God said to Cyrus, you will conquer. He said, I will loose the belt of kings. Kings would wear their weapons around a belt on their waist. And so to loosen the belt of the king would be for his weapons to fall to the ground and thus render him defenseless. He said that the gates will be open before you. And, and interestingly, historically, when Cyrus went to Babylon, so Babylon was world emperor, empire number one, Cyrus and Persia, world empire number two. And you're like, how did we transition from Babylon to Persia? It happened in a moment just like that because so fed up were the people of Babylon with the rulers that were corrupt and destroying their lives in Babylon. And when they heard Cyrus was coming, one night they actually went down and flung open all the gates to the city. It was said that there were 100 bronze gates to the city and they were all open so that Cyrus came flooding in and Babylon fell in less than 24 hours, just as God had predicted. And God's people are sitting on the sidelines hearing this prediction, and then they're in this predicament, and they're thinking, okay, God, you need to get us out of our stuff. You need to get us out of our situation. God's like, okay, here's here's what I'm going to do. And they're like, but not like that. And maybe you've had a moment like that with God. We were like, God, I need you to do something in my life. God, I believe you've given me a vision for what you want to accomplish in my life. God, I believe you want to do something great with my life. I believe that I, I'm supposed to serve you and accomplish something great for your kingdom. And God's like, okay, cool. I'm going to put you here. And you get there. And in the middle of being there, you're like, God, why did you put me here? Like, I thought I was supposed to go there and I'm here. And I don't see any way that I get from here to there because this looks like a disaster. And so I'm assuming that God's people were putting on their bitter teenage music. I have teenagers. Every once in a while, I hear this music. Have you heard of Olivia Rodrigo? I, I hope not, but I'm just picturing, I'm just picturing God's people blasting through the loudspeakers of their life, the lyric, you didn't cheat, but you're still a traitor. And, oh, let, let's, let's just move on to our second point. That leads us right into our second point, which is that God's people were questioning God's plan. And I'm going to describe this as a lesson from potters and parents. So the text actually gives the answer before answering, uh, addressing the objection. So actually, the, the way it lays out in the text is God tells us what he's doing with Cyrus, then he tells us why, and then God's people freak out and question which tells us a lot about their hearts and our hearts, which we're so stubborn to get what we want, when we want, how we want it, that we don't even listen to what God is saying he's doing. But I think for our sake, it's going to be better to trace the questions and then get the answers so that we can end on a note of hope and a note of trust. So let's go to the questions and and see why in the world is Israel so mad. Well, it goes beyond even God using Cyrus, and it deals with the future of Israel. So here's Israel in exile, and you can just picture some of the people in exile, and they've printed their flags, and they're waving them on their front porches saying, make Israel great again. And they were uh, super excited for God to come through and bring them a leader who's going to restore their nation to prominence. But they're thinking, like, how are you going to restore our nation to prominence when you're not raising up a leader from our nation? And God's like, hey, um, I'm going to get you back in your land. And 
you're still not going to be in control. And they're like, what good is it to be back in our land if there's still another king from another country ruling over us in our land? And so they're super ready to challenge God, which leads us to verse nine. A woe to him who strives with him who formed him. We, get, we got to pause right here. Uh, two things about this. First thing, woe, that's a big word. That's a word of condemnation. It's a word of damnation. It's a word of you're cursed if you do this. You're cursed if you do what? strives with God to challenge God, to question God. It takes a lot of chutzpah to say to God, God, let me tell you what your plan should really be. Striving with God, Jacob strove with God. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 32 when Jacob wrestled with God and at the end it said, you have striven with God. And Jacob was challenging what God was doing in his life and God overcame Jacob and he knocked his hip out of socket and showed him that he was in control of his life. And, and while Jacob was struggling with God, I think the word strives here is not just that we're questioning and challenging. I think God has space for that. I think it's more of an arrogant, I'm going to tell you how it is, God. And, and the text says, don't be that man or woman who says to God, I'm going to tell you how you should run the world. And then he gives us two examples of what it would look like for something smaller to tell someone or something bigger how to run the world. And the examples are potters and parents. Here, here's what it says. Uh, does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? So God says, challenging God is like a pot saying to the one forming it, you're doing a really crummy job at clay artistry. Now I can understand why the pot might feel that way. Because you're on this like thing that's spinning you around and then the fingers are just like poking and prodding you. And when they finally get done poking and prodding and shaping you, they toss you in an oven. And so you're like, this isn't very cool. And God's like, you are responding like the clay. You've got a pottery mouth problem. You keep saying to God, you don't know what you're doing. You should be doing it better. And then we get verse 10. And, and you need to laugh at verse 10 because verse 10 is actually really sarcastic and awesome. So, so God says, this is like you say to a parent, with what are you in labor? Okay, so here's, here's what's going on. You know how it's like a really dumb idea to see a woman on the street and be like, hey, are you pregnant? Okay, it's even worse to go up to the woman while she's giving birth and being like, hey, what are you pregnant with? A cow, bro. I'm giving birth to a cow. What do you think I'm pregnant with? Do you see the foolishness of the question? And God said, when you challenge God's plan, it's like you're saying to a parent, you're giving birth to a little baby seal and so therefore, you don't control the destiny of what you're giving birth to. But God said, just as the potter has power over the clay pot that is being shaped, just as a parent for the beginning years of a child's life has control of the destiny of where the child will live and where the child would go, God has control over his people and the unfolding of history because history plays out according to the plans of God. And God says, hey, if you still want to challenge me, let's do a little resume competition, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and the one who formed him. Ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created humans on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens. And I commanded all their host. I've stirred him up in righteousness. This is back to, to Cyrus. I will make all his ways level. Cyrus shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. So God says, uh, you want to tell me how to run the world? Let's do a quick little resume check. And God's like, here's the deal. I made the world. You made a waffle this morning. Congratulations. <laughs> and God is saying as maker, he has information and perspective that we don't have. God said, I'm using Cyrus' 
to do something that you can't even comprehend. He said, all you know about kings and rulers is that they're for themselves, they're for their own money, they're for their own fame, they're for their own prominence, and they trample people. He's like, but I'm gonna shape history by shaping the one who shapes history, in this case, Cyrus, for your good to do something you couldn't fathom. He said, Cyrus is going to rebuild my city, and he's not gonna do it for price or reward. He said, kings in that culture, all they ever do is stuff that'll make themselves get rich. He's like, but Cyrus is gonna actually lose on this deal. He's going to lose financially on this deal, and that's exactly what happens. We have the historical record in the book of Exodus. Let me just give you a couple verses from there. Exodus chapter 6, verses 3, 4, and 5 says this, in the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices were offered. Let its foundations be retained. Its height shall be 60 cubits, its breast 60 cubits with three layers of great stones and one layer of timber. So, so Cyrus is like, hey, uh, build, build a temple for God and make it big and make it nice. And then this at the end of verse four, let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. And also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar, that was the uh, first king of Babylon when uh, Babylon conquered Israel, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem and brought back to Babylon, let the vessels be restored and brought back to the temple that is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. What king is like, hey, um, go ahead and build God's building and pay for it. And all the treasure that we just plundered from Babylon after we conquered them, you know that the treasure that Babylon stole 200 years ago from a nation that barely even exists anymore? He's like, go ahead and give them all their treasure back. What, what king does that? And God says, Cyrus is going to do that. Why? Because God shapes the ones who shape history because God is shaping history for his plans and his purposes. And if you can trust that God is shaping history in the past, you can trust that God is shaping your history in the present. So what was God's end goal with Cyrus? That leads us to understanding God's plan, our third and final point. And the reason God was doing what he was doing is that people may know him. So we actually see a three part progression in the middle verses that we're going back to verses uh, three to six. And the three part progression is that Cyrus might know, that Israel might know, that the world might know. Why is God doing what he's doing? Because he wants people to know him. He wants people to know that the reason things are happening is because he is at work and he's doing them. Now, Cyrus wasn't a super expert at knowing that God was doing that. I already mentioned that Cyrus worshiped a lot of gods, but some people who study biblical history, there's a section in Ezra where Cyrus actually declares praise to God. And so they're like, look, Cyrus is praising God. This is a good thing. But, but then you've got to study history and you realize that Cyrus was kind of like Oprah. And Cyrus just found every God that every nation worshiped. And he's like, you get a praise and you get a praise and you get a praise and you get a praise. And, and Cyrus was just an equal opportunity worshiper because he was hoping that he might eventually hit on the right one that would give him a little bit of blessing. And God's not super into that. God's not like, hey, I hope you just manage to slip my name in while you're worshiping all the gods. God's like, I hope that you'll see that your stuff comes from me. So did you see what it said there in verse three? I'm gonna give you the treasures and the hoards in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who called you by name. And when God blesses, he blesses so that we'll see him. But how often do we think that our blessings are for us and achieved by us? How often do we think that it's because of my athletic prowess, it's because of my intelligence, it's because of my beauty, it's because of the skill that I bring to the table that I have what I have. And God says, I want you to know that I'm doing for you what I'm doing because I want you to see that I am good and I am for you. And man, we saw a pretty tragic example just this week of someone who got everything the world had to offer but totally missed the point of God giving it to him. I don't know if you guys are sports fans, but if you follow the NFL, there's a wide receiver. He graduated from the University of Alabama a couple of years ago. His name's Henry Ruggs, a super fast wide receiver, drafted in the first round, got a $9 million signing bonus. And he was having a really good season. This was his second season in the NFL. He had some touchdown passes and was really ascending as a player for the Raiders. But late Monday, early Tuesday, it was about 3.30 a.m., he was twice the legal limit, 0.15, I think, blood alcohol level. And he took his Corvette and was driving 156 miles an hour. 
And he came up behind a woman who was parked at a stoplight and couldn't get stopped and plowed right into her. And she died in that accident, the woman that he hit. And, and here's the thing. He had everything this world had to offer, but he has nothing because he didn't recognize that God gave him that stuff so that he would recognize who God was and live for the Lord instead of living for himself. And God said to Cyrus, I gave you this stuff that you might know that I am God. And do you know why God gives you what he gives you? But then the next two parts go together that Israel would know that the world would know. Let's look at these verses. Verse four, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you though you don't know me. I'm the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I equip you though you do not know me that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. No, I love that. God says to Cyrus, I'm going to equip you though you don't know me. I'm going to name you, give you a role though you don't know me. So here's the thing about history. Maybe in your history class, you studied the Greeks and Aristotle and Socrates in some depth, and maybe you studied the Roman Empire in some depth. I'm guessing most of you didn't study the Persian Empire in much depth. So Cyrus was the greatest man of his generation. He was the richest, most powerful man. But the only reason we know Cyrus's name in the United States of America in the year 2021 is because he took a backwater nation, Israel, that lived in a backwater outpost near the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea, and he said, I'm going to send you back to your home country, and I'm going to let you rebuild your city. And here's the map on the screen of God's people moving back home, and Cyrus would be lost to history, but for what he did for God's people Israel. And that's why it said in verse 4, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. And so do you see how history is unfolding? Cyrus thought that he was building the kingdom of Cyrus, but what he was actually doing was accomplishing the purposes of God. And isn't that how God so often works in our lives? It looks like people are acting for their own self-interest. It looks like people are hurting us and misusing us and doing whatever for whatever various motive or reason they have. But God said, I'm behind the scenes working through the controls of history and I'm accomplishing something in your life that wouldn't be accomplished any other way. And you're like, God, why are you using this broken road? And the answer is because this broken road is the only road that's gonna get you to the destination where you need to be. And so here's the rest of the story. It's so that Israel would know why, why so that the world would know. Because here's the thing. When God said, I'm going to bring about the Mashiach, the anointed one who's going to be the new and greater David to shepherd and care for God's people. There were some promises in place. And the first promise was that this anointed one was going to come from the offspring and the lineage of Abraham from the Jewish people. And then the prophet said, he's going to be born because he's a new and greater David. He's going to be born in Bethlehem, David's hometown. And get this, it was going to be super hard for the anointed one to be born in David's hometown if God's people people were stuck as prisoners of war somewhere else. And so the Babylonians had a policy of exporting all the prisoners of war and leaving them in Babylon to assimilate into their culture. And eventually their lineage would be wiped out through generations of intermarriage. And so God's like, I can't let you be in Babylon much longer than 70 years, or you're going to intermarry and intermarry and the, the lineage and the legacy will be lost. So God's like, I got to get the Babylonians out of power. And so I'm going to put the Persians in power. And the people are like, why the Persians? Because the Persians had a policy of returning people to their homeland. And God's like, the thing about history is I need my people in my promised land so that the Messiah can be born exactly where it was promised he would be born. So the Messiah could arrive exactly where it was promised that the Messiah would arrive. And so here's the thing about Jesus, the Messiah. He is the true Israel. Because Israel is no longer just a collection of people. Israel gets focused into the one true servant who will accomplish the purposes of God. 
in restoring all of humanity to know who God is. See, 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 back when God showed up to Abraham, he said, I'm gonna bless you so that through you, all the peoples on earth will be blessed. That was the job description of Israel. And Israel blew it because they sinned and they got booted out of the land. But God's like, I'm gonna focus Israel now, not one nation, but just into one anointed one, one Mashiach. And he's going to do what the nation was supposed to do. And he's going to remove the people, not from exile in Babylon, but from exile in sin. And he's going to deal with the people's suffering, not because they're not the world dominating empire, but because they're dominated by Satan himself. And he's going to come along and he's going to offer freedom to anyone who would incorporate themselves into who he is. And so God's promises had to take place so that God's son could be born and go to the cross and take our sin and our shame so that God could offer to all people on earth a way to be reconciled to God. So do you see it? Do you see it? The point of what God's doing through Cyrus wasn't about Cyrus. The point of what God was doing through Cyrus wasn't even about that generation of the people of Israel. The point of what God was doing was to accomplish his great grand purpose for the entire world. And if you can trust God to accomplish his big picture for the entire world, you can trust God to accomplish his purpose for your life. And you're like, why, why, why am I going through what I'm going through? And maybe God's got to get you in a new place because there's somebody there who needs to hear from you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe God's got to get you to a new situation because there's discipleship and growth opportunities for your heart to know and love Jesus more that you never would have gotten if you'd have stayed where you were. And so you're like, God, what is going on in my life? And the answer is God is doing something to get you where he wants you. And we trust him in the process because you've only got two choices. You've only got two choices and the choices are these. You can question God's plan in your life and get mad and bitter and depressed. And God, why are you doing this? And I'm not sure if you're good and I'm not sure I can trust you. And so many people get off track because they go through a season where they don't trust God through the process and they don't understand the why. And if they don't understand the why, they let go of the who. And God said, you need to cling to me through the what and the how that you don't understand because at the end of the day, I'm taking you to the where that you need to be. So will you question God's plan or will you run in faith to Jesus? See, I don't know what the thing is that you're facing, but I know that in a room this size, there's a lot of us facing a lot of different things. And so as the band comes forward, I'm gonna invite us to just take a moment to allow the spirit of God to do some work in us and to allow the spirit of God to say, this is your thing that you're facing, but you can give that in trust to Jesus Christ and say, God, I, I, I don't know why you're leading me through this, but I'm going to trust you through it anyways, because I believe that you're doing something awesome inside of me. And so Lord, we come to you in faith. Maybe it's just the faith of a mustard seed, but we offer you the faith that we have. And we believe that if you've accomplished your purposes in the generations of the past, if you've accomplished your purposes in preparing the way for Jesus Christ to come, you can accomplish your purposes in our lives. That our lives would be a testimony to the transforming goodness and greatness of Jesus. So Lord, I pray for each one here, each man, woman, child, Lord, would you be showing them that they can trust you afresh this morning with the things that they're facing. And I pray this morning that there would be prayers of faith rising to the rafters of this room from hearts that say, God, I don't know why, but I know you and I trust you. I trust you. So Lord, we trust you and we declare it by singing out Great are you, Lord. It's in the great name of Jesus we pray.